I'd like to thank you for the warm welcome and introduction. I especially want to thank the Palm Springs Art Museum, the Black History Committee, and the director of the museum, Adam Lerner, for providing me with this platform for sharing my thoughts about Black history, talking to you about my history as an artist, and introducing you to a whole new body of work, which I will be unveiling for the first time tonight. Before I begin, I would like to express my appreciation for the work of those who selected the art, envisioned its display, and made it happen. That is Hilary Roberts, Jessica Macias, the museum staff, and Alfonso Murray. So let me begin. To me, Black history is a history of people who have struggled to make their dreams come true. Far too many dreams have been crushed by enslavement, discrimination, lack of opportunity, and racial violence. Black history has been a struggle for a seat at the table and a struggle to use that seat to make a better life for themselves, their families, and their communities. You all know about those who have succeeded, like Barack Obama, Martin Luther King, Harry Belafonte, Maya Angelou, Ida B. Wells, Billie Holiday, and Rosa Parks. I want to introduce you to just a few of the lesser-known individuals who have big dreams and persisted through all the obstacles to take their seats and have a positive impact. Well, first I would like to start with Polly Murray. She, her real name is Pauline Murray and she was born in 1910 and she died in 1985. But this woman was denied an opportunity to be raised by her biological parents. Her mother died of a brain hemorrhage and her father was beaten to death in a mental institution. She was denied the opportunity to pass as white like her biracial relatives she was sent to live with in North Carolina. She was denied a seat at Columbia Law School because she was a woman. She was denied a seat at the University of North Carolina because she was black. She was denied a seat at Harvard Law School because of gender. She was denied representation by the NAACP. She was given a seat at Howard University, but was denied the opportunity to speak, and she coined a phrase, Jane Crow. She was denied a seat on a bus in the white section and was arrested 15 years before Rosa Parks. She was denied acceptance of her sexuality because she felt she was a man in a woman's body. But what she did, she became a lawyer, professor, author, poet, civil rights activist, women's rights activist, the first black attorney general, the first female Episcopalian priest. She desegregated a diner 17 years before the 1960 sit-in. She wrote papers that two Supreme Court justices used in cases that they won. Thurgood Marshall considered her states on race and color book, The Bible, in his Brown versus Board of Education, and Ruth Ginsburg in her Read versus Read, Discrimination on the Basis of Sex. She created a seat for herself and the rights for others.
And this lady is Claudette Colvin. She was born in 1939. She still lives. She was a retired nurse and activist who was arrested at the age of 15 in 1955 in Alabama for refusing to give a white woman her seat on a crowded bus nine months before Rosa Parks. She felt the NAACP did not represent her because of her image. She did not have good hair, was dark skin, and was a pregnant teenager. Her record was expunged in December of 2021. Her seat and participation in court cases created the permanent removal of segregated busing on, in Alabama. Willa Brown was born in 1906, and she died in 1992. A biracial woman from Kentucky, was a social worker, and became the first to obtain her pilot's license, a civil patrol license, first to obtain a mechanic's license, a commercial license in aviation, and co-founded the Coffee School of Aeronautics with her husband. She was selected by the U.S. Army Corps to train blacks for a training pilot program at the Tuskegee Institute. Many of her students became the Tuskegee Airmen. On December 10, 2014, her living nieces, Jennifer Mixon and Joycelyn Murph, accepted her Civil Air Patrol Congressional Gold Medal of Honor. She created a seat for herself at the head of the table and for those who wanted to a career in the field of aviation. Vivian Carter was born in 1921, and Jimmy Brackett was born in 1909. They formed VJ Records in 1953 after borrowing $500 from a pawnbroker to start the largest black-owned record company in the world. It was situated in Gary, Indiana, six years before Motown. Vivian was a disc jockey, and Jimmy owned a record store. I would like to give you a snapshot of their artists and genres. Blues, the famous John Lee Hooker, Jimmy Reed. They did doo-wop, the Dells, the Spinnels, Spaniels, forgive me. Uh, so, Jerry Butler, Curtis Mayfield, Betty Everett, Gospel, the Staple Singers, the Five Blind Boys, the Caravans, in jazz, Eddie Harris, Lee Morgan, Wayne Shorter, in pop, the Four Seasons, and um, the Highwaymen, that was their former name, the Beatles from Britain. They also had R&B and had Jimi Hendrix and Billy Preston. And on their comedic list was Dick Gregory. They created seats of collaboration and seats for entertainers to be heard. Ella Josephine Baker was born in 1903, and she died in 1986. She was a nurse. She co-founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. She was the first director, and Martin Luther King was the president of the field secretary for the NAACP. She helped students form the Non-Student Violence Coordinating Committee. Her nickname, which I love, is Fundi. It's a Swahili word, and it means a person who teaches a craft to the next generation. Recognized as a community organizer, she created a seat at the table for herself and helped others to have a voice in their community. 
Carlton Highsmith. Born in 1951, he's still alive. He worked 10 years for a global packaging firm of Amstar and Rexham. Afterwards, he founded SPG in New Haven, Connecticut, the largest black-owned paperboard packaging for consumers in North America. His annual income was $180 million. He landed a $100 million contract with Procter & Gamble for products like Crest, Tide, Iris Springs, etc. He employed over 600 uh, people. He merged with Paperworks and became the third largest paper board in North America. He founded CONCAT in 2011, and it teaches culinary arts, medical, and phlebotomy. Now he is building a plaza to reestablish a burgeoning community, black community near Yale University. With his success, he was able to fund the needs of his community. He sat at the head of the table. And that's the plaza that he's building. Clarence Blanchard. He was born in 1962. He's still alive. He, uh, he attended music camps with Winton and Branford Marsalis in New Orleans. His father was an insurance salesman, and his mother was an opera singer. Clarence is a musician, composer, arranger, orchestrator, who plays the piano, keyboard, and trumpet. He is best known for his music in the Spike Lee movies. He is the first black person or entertainer to reopen the 130-year-old Metropolitan Opera Company with his musical composition of Fired Shut Up My Bones as an achievement that would make the deceased William Grant Still proud. His seat transcended another barrier in the music world. Mary Edmonia Lewis was born in 1844, and she died in um, 1907 in London. Her biracial parents died, and her half-brother financed her education with his gold rush money. Oberlin College accused her of poisoning two classmates and stealing supplies. Due to racism, she left school a year before graduating. Her artistic success and popularity in Boston financed her trip to Rome because she felt opportunities, art, culture, and social atmosphere in a place where she would not be reminded of her color. Her studio became a tourist attraction, and she amassed many clients because of her sculpting talents. She received a $50,000 commission during her artistic journey, something that many artists had not achieved presently. She created she created herself for herself as an artist and became a role model for other artists. And here's some of her work. Okay. Now, I, I, I mentioned a number of times biracial in this talk, but there are varying levels of colorism in the black community. For some, one drop of black blood meant you were black. If you were lighter than a paper bag, you were considered acceptable. And if your skin looked white, you could obtain certain privileges. 
Many lighter hues have rose to prominent positions, but were still subjected to su- discrimination and denied seats at certain tables. And this is Ron Finley. He is the founder of the Gangster Garden. He grew up in South Central L.A. with seven siblings. He wanted um, clothing, and his, his family couldn't afford it, so they, he started making clothes, his own clothes. Afterwards, he attended L.A. Technical School and soon got contracts with Nordstrom's, Saks Fifth Ave, Neiman Marcus, and um, many NFL players bought his um, wares. So after that, he started growing gardens on city sidewalks. He was arrested. and No, he is His arrest was imminent until the city realized how beneficial his actions were. He teaches the community how to transform food deserts into vegetable sanctuaries. He believes people should become gangster gardeners instead of criminals. He created a seat, a seat in fashion world for himself and saw the need in his community and created an environment where people could grow. Now, I don't know who's had Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles, but (laughs) if you have, uh, we're going to talk about this. This was a concept started in 1975 in Hollywood, California by Herb Hudson. He was denied bank loans, uh, and, but he could get a loan for a car. In spite of the difficulties of starting a restaurant, getting employees, and all the struggles that go along with this business, it became a hit with celebrities, politicians, and the general po- population. Roscoe's is the largest black-owned franchise with eight locations, one to open in San Diego and one to open in the Palm Springs area. Global franchising is currently in discussion. Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles' success has opened opportunities for his employees and other businesses. He has hired over a 1,000 employees. Herb Hudson created a seat at the table, at the head of the table, and the largest black-owned food franchise. Bernard C. Jackson was born in 1927, and he died in 1996. He was a native of Brooklyn, New York, who spoke fluent Spanish, and he came to California. The Watts riot was the catalyst for him to start a colorblind cultural institution. Today's well-known actors like Bea Richards, Lou Gossett, Denzel Washington, George Takai, Pat Marina, and playwright August Wilson studied and performed their crafts there. Bernard stated, Most of my family went to jail, and I would have too, except somehow I ended up in a high school of music and art. That changed my life. It got me out of the neighborhood, and it certainly convinced me that art was a valuable tool for changing ways of perceiving the world. He created a seat for himself and a seat for culturally diverse communities. Well, okay, now let me tell you a bit about my work as an African-American artist and the messages I attempt to communicate to my audiences as I strive to take my seat in the art world. As I look over the bodies of work I have produced over my lifetime, one thing stands out 
above all others, and that is my work deals with social justice issues. I attempt to make people aware of social injustices in the world without judgment, and by doing so, urge them to do something about it. Another theme is to evoke emotions from people who have been suppressed, who their feelings have not been acknowledged, and thinking that they're the only ones who have gone through a trauma. There is a healing effect from some of my work. The works that are on display in the museum comes from four different bodies of work. The large acrylic paintings of a woman holding a baby cloaked in a colorful kente fabric is one of six pieces in the kente collection. Two of them are eight feet by five feet. One was purchased by Seton Hall University and became a part of their religious iconographic collection. The large black and white charcoal is one of uh, 12 series in a traveling exhibit entitled Impact on Innocence, Mass Incarceration. This exhibit brings to the attention of my audience the impact mass incarceration has on those left behind, their children and families. While our society needs to address the root causes of those wrongfully imprisoned and the disproportionate imprisonment of people of color, those left behind are being ignored. This exhibit was premiered at the Augustus Savage Gallery at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and was last exhibited at the Los Angeles Museum of Social Justice. In fact, the whole exhibit is on their website. A row of sticks bound with twine is a small part of my Roots by the River series. This collection features spirit figures built on tree branches using colorful fabric adorned with symbols used by enslaved Africans communicate, to communicate their plans to escape. While everybody knows about the Underground Railroad, Few are aware of the strategic use of river routes from the Deep South all the way to Canada and elsewhere. Finally, the large rectangular transition examines the choices people make for their final resting place, burial, cremation, or reincarnation. The mask resemble, represents their commonalities from around the world. My talk tonight has centered on the need for everyone to have a seat at the table or to have a voice to tackle the most difficult challenges in the world today. My latest body of work attempts to show that even the ugliest, damaged, discarded objects of life can be res resurrected restored and reclaimed with, little, with a little imagination, creativity, and hard work. So now we will go to my body of work. This, these, <laughs> okay, let me, let me just say this to this, okay. Oh, it's, it's here somewhere, but, with this, okay, it attempts, with this chair, it attempts to show even the ugliest, the damaged, the discarded objects can be resurrected, restored, and reclaimed, just like us. Just like us, you know, if you feel like you're uh, ugly, discarded, and nobody wants you, Beauty can be made with just a little creativity and a little help. I call these 
Free Fabulous Finds Arts Chairs. This chair is from the 1800s. At the top, you can see cotton. Around the, well, it looks like the neck, you can see rope. You can see the chain. You can see tension all around the bottom. But I call that 1800, because it symbolizes what went on in the 1800s. On the back, you can't see. I have the Mexican flag. I have Native American. I have Chinese. All these people existed during the 1800s. This is believed. Now, when the light hits that cross, you can see a rainbow behind it. These are all broken chairs. I'm going a little fast. This is the end, but <laughs> I, I didn't give you enough time to see it. But I want to thank you all for coming. Please come back to the museum because the, the director and his staff, they have a lot of wonderful things going on. And I really, really appreciate the support you have given me tonight and those who, who helped this event come to fruition. I'm thankful. Oh, do you have any questions? <laughs> if, you, if you have any questions, raise your hand. None? Oh. How long have you been practicing art, or have you been making art? OK. I don't have any sisters or brothers. So art became my friend. And I've been drawing and painting, you know, I used to say my friends were my shadow and art. Okay? And, and, and that's happened. And I've always been interested in the plight of others and um, giving them a voice without judgment. Because it's not about judgment. It's about helping somebody. Can you introduce us to your family? Oh, yes, they, oh, yes, okay. My husband is there, Salase. My daughter, Nubia, and my friend, Dina, <laughs> and other friends, I can't name them all, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, and my link sisters. <laughs> Are we? Okay. Do we have any more questions? Okay. How long did it take you to conceptualize a piece from start to finish? Because when you found the object, she wasn't completed. Well, you know. Did you ever hear the question? How long did it take to complete a piece from the time you conceptualize it to the time you finish it? Well, Okay, it depends on the piece. Sometimes I, I love materials, so I can find something on the street or things that I repurpose. Um, so if it's something that I've repurposed, it may take, I would say, at least three weeks to months. That's what it takes because usually I do research on what I'm, what type of art that I'm going to make. Even though I've been inspired by what somebody has said, I want to read uh, what other people who have felt about that same situation. So then I can get a broader perspective. And when I create the artwork, then it's not like, for one person, it, it represents a community. Did I answer that? OK. Um, I have a question. Uh, so you, you, work, you work in 
so many different materials, and sometimes you do paintings, and you do sculpture, sometimes furniture. Is there a is there a home base for you? Is there, or is it? Are you always working in all the different? Well, you know, I like to experiment, and um, again, the materials influence my my decisions. So, like for the black and white charcoal, I usually don't work in charcoal, but because I thought that material would tell, communicate the story better. So that's why I use that. Um, on the transition, why did I use that technique? Because I was work thinking about the other side. What does the other side look? I mean, you know, I asked the question, does heaven have a ghetto? I mean, not to be, but I want to know. I want to know what it's like or what it isn't. So I, I work that way. Did I answer your question? Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, one thing is, does anyone else feel this? But every time Deborah talks, I just feel like so calmed. <laughs> I love it. I could listen to her all day. Um, and I want to just um, say that we're very lucky to have with us Congressman Ruiz. And Congressman, would you be interested in coming to the podium? Hello everyone, I'm Congressman Dr. Raul Ruiz, and good to, thank you. And uh, I'm a student of art because I'm a student of life, and a lot of my personal uh, development has been expressed also through art. And I explained to my wife and my daughters as I'm painting that it's the relationship that I have with the art and the story and the dialogue uh, because it changes. And sometimes when you're done, you sit back and it speaks to you in different ways that you even imagine it takes on a whole life of itself. Yes. And the word that I think that really hit me that you said here is the repurpose. If you have to repurpose. And oftentimes in our lives, we come up to challenges and obstacles and we try to ask ourselves, what is my purpose? And so we sometimes have to repurpose ourselves, right? In, in, a, in a spiritual makeover to be able to achieve that next goal, that next level that we want to achieve. So you've inspired many. You've inspired me, my wife, Monica, who's here with us. And so because of that, I want to, yes, please, my wife, Monica, who's the real boss in the house. Yes, absolutely. Um, I want to present to you the Certificate of Congressional Recognition in honor of your presentation here today and the work that you do. Thank you. Oh, this is so unexpected. Thank you, thank You're you, welcome. thank you. Okay. 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 You invited him. Adam, I want to present this certificate of congressional recognition to the Palm Springs Art Museum in honor of hosting events during the Black History Month, which is so very important for all of our communities to really reflect and honor the African-American experience and the communities that live here as our neighbors. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me open mine. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. I'll give you, I'll give you a card. Well, thank my you all card. for coming. I hope you'll card. join us for our upcoming events. So, see you soon.